This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 2. Individualism and Collectivism 23. To be avoided above all is establishing society once again as an abstraction over against the individual. The individual is the social being. The expression of his life, even if it does not appear immediately in the form of communal expression carried out together with others, is therefore a manifestation and affirmation of social life. The individual and generic life of man are not distinct, however much, and necessarily so, the mode of existence of individual life is either a more particular or a more general mode of generic, or generic life a more particular or universal mode of individual life. Though man is therefore a unique individual, and precisely this particularity makes him an individual, a really individual communal being, he is equally the totality, the ideal totality, the subjective existence of society as thought and experienced. 24. Altruism is the other side of the coin of hell is other people, only this time mystification appears under a positive sign. Let's put an end to this old soldier crap once and for all. For others to interest me, I must find in myself the energy for such an interest. What binds me to others must grow out of what binds me to the most exuberant and demanding part of my will, volonté, to live, not the other way around. It is always myself that I am looking for in other people, my enrichment, my realization. Let everyone understand this, and each for himself, taken to its ultimate conclusion, will be transformed into all for each. The freedom of one will be the freedom of all. A community which is not built on the demands of individuals and their dialectic can only reinforce the oppressive violence of power. The other, in whom I do not find myself, is nothing but a thing, and altruism leads me to the love of things, to the love of my isolation. For myself, I recognize no equality except that which my will to live according to my desires recognizes in the will to live of others. Revolutionary equality will be indivisibly individual and collective. 25. Let us notice, first of all, that the so-called rights of man are simply the rights of a member of civil society, that is, of egoistic man of man separated from other men and from the community. Liberty is, therefore, the right to do everything which does not harm others. The limits within which each individual can act without harming others are determined by law, just as a boundary between two fields is marked by a stake. It is a question of liberty of man regarded as an isolated monad, withdrawn into himself. Liberty as a right of man is not founded upon the relations between man and man, but rather upon the separation of man from man. It is the right of such separation, the right of the circumscribed individual withdrawn into himself. It leads every man to see in other men not the realization, but rather the limitation of his own liberty. 26. Too many corpses strew the path of individualism and collectivism. Under two apparently contrary rationalities has raged an identical gangsterism, an identical oppression of the isolated man. 27. Is it necessary once again to point out the self-absurdity of the one-sided abstractions, the individual and society, and of the ideologies founded on this one-sidedness, individualism or egoism, and so-called socialism or collectivism? We can be individuals only socially. We can be social only individually. Individuals constitute society. Society constitutes individuals. 28. Dig deeply enough into the individual and you will find society. Dig deeply enough into society and you will find the individual. Dig deeply enough into either and you will come out the other side. The concept named the individual, fully grasped, is the same as the concept named society. The concept named society, fully grasped, is also the individual. One is impossible, does not exist, 
without the other. At the heart of society is its opposite, the individual. At the center of the individual is his antithesis, society. We must speak of the social individual. Both of the abstract universals, society and the individual, find their concrete universal in the social individual. 29. Society, without the individual, is empty, is without its existence, just as the individual, without society, is without its existence. And even outside human society is not a human individual, even if it should chance to survive as a biological individual. However, even as such, it is the issue of a human social, in this case sexual, relationship. Unless both these moments can be affirmed simultaneously, univocally, grasped as a single unitary concept, in fact as a conceptual singularity, their contradiction having been transcended, to begin with in thought, then neither the individual nor society has been understood. 30. Self-production can only be social. Society is self-production. That is, society is the only possible means of production of selves. You cannot ever talk about the self without identically implicating or talking about society. The self exists only in association with other selves, i.e. in and as an association of selves, a society. It is no accident that the Latin root of consciousness, conscienta, means literally together knowledge, to know together. Subjectivity is essentially intersubjective, that is, essentially social. 31. Your individuality is already a social structure, and has been so from its very inception, including from its very conception. 32. Individuals are produced only by society. Society is produced only by individuals. 33. Society can be realized only egoistically, just as the ego can be arrived at, can be realized, and is possible at all, only socially. 34. The self is preeminently and essentially social. Society is preeminently and essentially selfish. 35. If the philosophers of one-sided individualism, of narrow egoism, that is, of the axiology of the self, want to understand Marx's socialism, they should reflect on his statement to the effect that the other is a necessary part of yourself. 36. The principle, I want nothing other than myself, the principle of self-desire, self-attachment, self-cathexis or self-centration, becomes the principle of daily life in communist society once it is socially actualized that the other is a necessary part of myself. Society becomes an object of cathexis without this any longer necessitating projection identification, i.e. the alienation of cathexis from the self. Once the social nature of the self and the self-nature of society has become a palpable and transparent truth of experience. 37. State capital, in sublating private capital, negates or represses private capital. The ideology of anti-individualism, that is of collectivism or one-sided socialism, so essential to Maoism in particular and to revolutionary ideology in general, is congruent precisely with the project of the repression of private capitalism and private accumulation, together with the characterological tendencies corresponding to these, on the part of bureaucratic capitalism, state capitalism. This policy of repression, typified by the Maoist slogan, Smash Self, also has the effect of inhibiting the emergence of communist egoism within the home proletariat, a form of egoism which the bureaucracy confounds, consciously or unconsciously, with bourgeois egoism. 38. Even privatism itself is a social expression. See Thesis 23. An expression of social life in a definite historical form of society. That is, privatism is itself an expression of the social individual produced by contemporary society. People who do not think dialectically end up making enormous errors here, practically as well as theoretically, because they cannot grasp contemporary anti-socialism as itself a social truth, an admittedly self-reproducing subjectification, i.e. internalization, of capitalist society, 
which is precisely an antisocial society. So much so that the socialization of society is, where capitalist society is concerned, but another name for the project of social revolution itself. The ideologies of anti-socialism are based on the misery of association, collective boredom, inauthentic association, etc., under contemporary conditions. That is, on the misery of association as alienation and as estrangement. They are expressions of the poverty of social life, its virtual non-existence as such, in the world of strangers, the bellum omnium contra omnis, which is capitalist society. 39. The leftist, trapped in the permanent false choice between following his own immediate desires and sacrificing for his ideals, despises the selfish person who unhesitatingly chooses immediate private satisfaction. The genuine communist also despises this latter type, but for the opposite reason. Being restricted to immediate private satisfaction is not satisfying enough. To the communist, furthermore, for such selfish people to remain satisfied with their privatized, alienated lives is a direct barrier to the realization of the communist's own expanded self-interest. Somewhere in every rank-and-file leftist lurks a confused intuition that this is the real reason for his contempt. But this intuition is continually stifled by the leftist's own insistence on the necessity of sacrifice. 40. The lonely individualism of Ayn Rand is only alienation accepted and alienation perfected. Communist individualism, or individualist communism, is the name for the solution to the riddle of prehistory, which while it has momentarily, at times and places in this century, existed, as yet knows not its own name. 41. Any collectivism on our part is an individualist collectivism. Any individualism on our part is a collectivist individualism. 42. Nothing is more to me than myself. Fine. As it stands, this theorem is wholly acceptable. This is a classic statement of the egoistic postulate by the classic exponent of individualist anarchism and narrow egoism and an early antagonist of Marx, Max Stirner. His latter-day followers, conscious and unconscious, include the objectivists, the classical liberals, and the so-called libertarian right in general. The problem is that, in the further elaboration of his own book, Stirner's own understanding of his own statement proved to be unequal to it. Stirner proved to be insensitive to what the concept of self, in order to be adequate to reality, must entail, what must be its content, if it is expanded, i.e. developed, beyond the level of its self-contradiction, namely, all of the other selves which intermutually constitute or produce it, in short, society. This error, in general, must be attributed to undeveloped concrete self-knowledge. Stirner did not know himself, his own true identity. He did not know himself as society, or society as his real self. 43. If the validity of the egoistic moment has not been understood, then nothing has been understood. For each social individual, when his life is at stake, everything is at stake. If I allow myself to be sacrificed, then I have allowed the whole world, all possible values, to be sacrificed as far as I am concerned. If I am lost, then all the world is lost to me. Each time a person dies, a world dies. 44. The community of egoists is the only possible community not founded on the repression of individual development and thus ultimately of collective development as well. 45. Communist egoism names the synthesis of individualism and collectivism, just as communist society names the actual, material, sensuous solution to the historical contradiction of the particular and the general interest, a contradiction engendered especially in the cleavage of society against itself into classes. This solution cannot be of the form of a mere idea or abstraction, but only of a concrete form of society. 46. The global and exclusive power of workers' councils, of the anti-state, of the associated producers, or generalized self-management, that is, concerted egoism, 
is the productive force and the social relation of production, which can supersede all the results of the uncoordinated egoistic activity of men. These are, in their totality, alienation. The unconscious development of the economy and the unconscious production by the proletariat of the economic laws of capitalism, with all their disastrous consequences for the proletariat. The theory of communist egoism is complete only as a theory of revolutionary organization and as a theory of revolutionary practice in general, as a theory of the new social relations and as a theory of the practice of the councils. That is, it is adequate only as a theory of communist society and as a theory of the transition from state capitalist to communist society. Obviously, then, these theses have still a long way to go toward the concrete. 47. The essence of communism is egoism. The essence of egoism is communism. This is the world-changing secret which the world at large still keeps from itself. The unraveling of this secret as the emergence of radical subjectivity is nothing other than the process of the formation of communist society itself. It already contains the objective process. 48. But man is only individualized through the process of history. He originally appears as a generic being, a tribal being, a herd animal, though by no means a political animal in the political sense. Exchange itself is a major agent of this individualization. 49. Thus, in a sense, all history has, in the long run, and if only implicitly, been a process of individualization. This individualization reaches its highest point of advertisement in the epic of corporate capitalism. But private property's individualism is not but its most cherished illusion. The predominant characteristic of private property is a materialized reification where the egoism of its subjects, capitalists and workers alike, is suppressed and subordinated to the pseudo-subjectivity of the economy for itself. The truth of the capitalist society and its private property is not individual property, but dispossession, v. the proletariat. The truth of private property is nothing other than the production, reproduction, and growth of a dispossessed and propertyless class, i.e. the class of wage labor. Private property is thus the very negation of individualism and of individual property. For the overwhelming majority of its subjects, i.e. the proletariat, Private property is by no means individual property, but rather it is a loss, i.e. a sale, alienation, of self, being for another. Even the capitalists are at best mere agents of capital, managers of their own and of the general dispossession. The mythical individualism of capitalist society can only be realized in its own negation, and in the negation of the society from which it sprang. Thus the Paris Commune of 1871 the first realized dictatorship of the proletariat, attempted to abolish private property in order to make individual property a truth. The capitalist mode of appropriation, the result of the capitalist mode of production, produces capitalist private property. This is the first negation of individual private property as founded on the labor of the proprietor. But capitalist production begets, with the inexorability of the law of nature, its own negation, it is the negation of the negation. This does not re-establish private property for the producer, but gives him individual property based on the acquisitions of the capitalist era, i.e. on cooperation and the possession in common of the land and of the means of production. The revolution of generalized self-management is the movement from narrow to full egoism, egoism's own self-enrichment. It is egoism's ascent from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.